Okay. Well, good morning, and good morning to those who may be looking in on Facebook, and we're continuing our look at the Gospel of John, and we're going to have to speed study, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us today, help us to cherish your word and receive it with thanksgiving. And uh, we pray these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We are at John chapter 9. Now, <clears throat> this is an interesting uh, chapter, so let's get into it. Someone read verses 1 to 6, please. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked, Rabbi, who said? Wait a minute. I'm at, oh, sorry. Hold on. Go ahead. I'm in the wrong Rabbi, place. who said, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming. When no one can work, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Okay. Now, uh, I looked this up a few months ago. This is the only recorded miracle in history of a blind person being given sight. It's the only time Jesus does it. So that's interesting in itself. What jumps out at you here? Yeah. This is important because Jesus never does the same miracle twice. Uh, the other thing is, this is kind of reminiscent of how he created Adam. Now, it was not, there was no uh, spit involved, but it, it was the dust and God breathed life into Adam. I think that connection is very deliberate. Because what happened after Adam and Eve bit into the fruit? What was the first thing that happened? Their eyes were opened. Now, uh, what the rabbis said, you've heard me say this before, was that previous to that point, they'd been blind. They were simply led by God. This is kind of a reversal of that. Here is God acting to give sight to someone who's blind in a positive way. This is a positive miracle. Joan, you wanted to say something. I was going to say that. It, it, I think that it seems like he does his miracles all different because if you get them the same, they would surely think that was a trick. Exactly. That's exactly right. So he always does things differently. This is why... You know, a lot of times people will say, well, he did this, so he, I'm going to pray for this exact same thing. It's God's sovereignty. He acts in the way he wishes to do. Notice, too, another thing here. We once more see the motif of light and dark that we've, uh, we've seen throughout this uh, gospel. So the man was in darkness, and Christ is giving him light. But... It turns out, uh, well, you know that passage in, in 1 Peter chapter 3 where he's talking about baptism and he says that the global flood that happened at the time of Noah is a teeny weeny symbol of the really great thing that happens when we're baptized. Uh, we, 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 are, we are saved through that. So uh, the idea here is uh, Peter is saying that's nothing compared to what God does every time someone is baptized. All right. So in a sense, Jesus is giving a foretaste of what's going to happen in this very interesting 
chapter 9 because he is he is taught he is using this miracle as a sign of how he has come to bring light into our darkness all right we're going to see that unfold even more Wayne you look like you're no okay all right so let's pick up from there this all goes together uh, would someone read verses 8 to 12 And he said, I do not know. Now, here's the deal. Uh, Siloam was a, a, a spring of water and people had a superstitious belief that if they washed their uh, whatever wounded part of their body in the, in, the, in the spring, they would be made right. Here's this man by the, the spring and Jesus comes to him and spits. Now, this, the spit of Jesus is better than the water of a spring. All right. Now, the other thing here is, is important. And by the way, Jesus initiates this. All right. Um, but this man, I love this man. He is a contrast to the man in chapter five. You remember he was had paralysis and Jesus healed him of his paralysis and he basically went to the authorities and said, hey, there he is. He was conspiring to get Jesus killed after Jesus had done this miracle for him. This man is the total opposite. And in fact, he reminds me of Nathaniel. You remember the first thing that Jesus said of Nathaniel when he met him in chapter one? Yes, but just before that, he said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Guile, by the way, is the same word that's used for who? In Genesis, the serpent. So here is uh, Nathaniel. He has no, here you go. Yeah. He has no guile. He is, he is, uh, uh, he is who he says he is. Well, here's the blind man. Uh, all of it, is, this, uh, is this the guy, you know? They're trying to discount the miracle. And he says, no, I, I'm the guy. There's no guile in him. He's not, um, he's not shrewd in the worldly sense. Yes, yes, yes. I think that I, I'm glad you brought that up because that's how the whole thing begins. There was an assumption that if any ill thing befell a person, it was because of their sin or the sin of their family. This is the assumption of Jonah's so-called friends. Remember in jo uh, Job's so-called friends. They, they come and they did a great thing for the first seven days. They shut up and listened. And then they tried to explain it. I'm not going to say this right, but then you say that's not. But then how is it that uh, you know, sins are passed from one generation? Yeah, our, I, our sin condition okay. is sin condition. Yeah, it's passed on from generation to generation. And the results of that, which is death. But no, what he's saying is it's not because... What they're trying to say is, what specific sin caused this? Because I can, I, I can avoid that sin. I mean, it's, it's, it's the human desire to be like God and be in control. That's what's going on here. And that's very important because that's what introduces the whole thing. And so the, Jesus does the sign to say, he wasn't born blind. Notice what he says. 
He wasn't born blind because of his sin or his parents. He was born blind so you could see this. The, the power of God and the grace of God and the love of God. Uh, the Wisdom Study Bible has an interesting footnote about the pool. So the Siloam pool was surrounded by a courtyard. Yep. It was slightly larger than it is today. It means sent. Reminds the reader that Jesus is sent by the Father and the blind man was sent by Jesus. Wordplay that brings the story together around the theme of sending. Yep. Yeah, it does. And then... Then we're sent. We receive the grace and then we're sent. Yeah, good. I'm glad you pointed that out. I don't want to be too speedy, but I want to be somewhat speedy. Okay. Uh, verses 13 to 17, please. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. By the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes on the Sabbath. Holy cow. How dare he do something good on the Sabbath, right? Okay. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Now, just uh, I'm just going to stop you here, Doug. He, he doesn't, he just says what happens. Yeah. That's what witnesses do, by the way. So like the woman at the well in chapter 4, who didn't have to go to seminary, right? Uh, This blind man said, this is what he did. Now, what we're going to see is, what we're going to see is that he is going to see more and more about Jesus. How? Because he's being pushed. Now, sometimes that's the way faith works. We're pushed by people who appear oppose faith or oppose Jesus and the more we're pushed the more we know about Jesus and we can rely on him and so faith is almost always I can't think of any exceptions but I'm going to just say almost always built in adversity (coughs) built in grief built in hard experiences okay Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such things? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he was blind. So this is, this is first, he, he, he gave me sight. He put mud on my eyes. Oh, now you ask me, you see how it, yeah. his... His understanding of Jesus is is escalating in the midst of their, not just opposition, but their unwillingness to even accept the idea that Jesus could be from God. He's not from God. He couldn't have done this miracle from God because if he had done it from God, he wouldn't have done it on the wrong day. Oh, he constantly does this because it's a way of getting at the law and how they depend on their interpretation of the law for salvation rather than on the grace of God given in Christ. Uh, Doug, do you mind reading on? still did not believe that he had been blind and had received the sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it now that he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes? He Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. Okay, right there. I can see the way this thing is going. And the religious authorities are against this whole thing. So, uh, bye, son. <laughs> they, 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 they pushed him out on the limb and they've sawed that limb. Ask him. He's of age. He's responsible for himself. Did you pick up from there, Doug? His parents said this is because they were afraid of his Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who had not 
acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Mm-hmm. That no. was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Okay, thank you. That's very interesting. So they don't want to have any association with this, you know, kind of controversial guy from Nazareth. And so they're willing to just throw their son overboard. This is how, by the way, it says there was a division. Jesus does create division. Those who believe and those who refuse to believe. Right? It's going to happen, even within families. We see it right here. All right, would someone pick up verses 24 to... uh, down to 34. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. You know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Let me just stop you right there. Okay, I, I don't have a theological assessment about Jesus, But I, this is the man with no guile. He doesn't, he doesn't say things to impress. He doesn't say things to save his own skin. He just tells the truth. I was blind. Now I see. I suppose that sounds somewhat familiar to you. Yeah. So, uh, so he's just a simple witness of the truth. Go ahead, John. Then they asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciple? <laughs> <laughs> now see, I think this is guileless. I don't think he's trying to be sarcastic here. He said, I, I told you. I mean, it's, it's just so, he's, He's an innocent. Uh, I mean, he's not innocent of sin, but he, he just tells the truth. I like that he doesn't accept the, their judgment of Jesus being a sinner. He's, I don't know. He's not. It's not you know, it wasn't up to him to decide. Yeah. In a sense, rejecting their determination of Jesus as a sinner. Yes. And they're doing all of this in order to intimidate him into giving them the answer they want to hear. Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. Whoa. This is the, the, these are the, the, the temple authorities. They're saying, this is what this guy is. Well, I, this is what happened. (laughs) Yeah. Their truth. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly does. And what's happening, again, he's moving more and more into the disciple zone, if you will. More and more into witnessing. Just because their words are forcing him to reflect on what he's experienced. Go ahead, Joan. So now what's going on here? He's saying, isn't it kind of obvious where he comes from? Because never in the history of the world has a person born blind been given sight. Shouldn't that be? Hello, McFly. (laughs) Right. But he says it without any sarcasm. And then they're just beside themselves. You know, it's like he. He inadvertently pushed all their buttons, you know, and he's like, you know, like, uh, uh, what is it, what is it, uh, Sam, Yosemite Sam. I mean, they're going crazy over this. And what do they do? It says in my translation, 
they cast him out. The word in the Greek, it's a very interesting word. It's, it's just, it is exactly what it seems to be. In the Greek, it is ek balo. Ek means out. Balo is throw. This is the word for He's been excommunicated. He's being told, you are no longer part of the people of God. You are no longer a Jew. You are no longer under the covenant of Abraham. We're throwing you out for telling the truth. Now, let's see what happens next with someone pick up from there verses uh, 35 through the end of the chapter. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out and when he had found him he asked do you believe in the son of man? Who is he sir? And they asked tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said you have now seen him. In fact he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said Lord I believe. Worship me. Jesus said for judgment I have come to this into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what? Are you blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see you are guilty of sin. This is a turning point in the gospel. And what we see here see is that the blind man sees and the sighted don't. Take a look at Genesis 3, verse 7. We've already alluded to this. It's after the fall. It says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. What Jesus is saying is, you know what you're doing to the religious authorities. Jesus was not killed by people who did not know who he was. He was killed by people who knew exactly who he was. But what they did not see was that God saved by grace through faith in this man. That's what they did not see. They did not receive faith because they refused to see Jesus for who he is even though they really knew. This this man's a threat to what? Our power. Our way of life. Jesus, yep. Jesus is always, friends, Jesus is always a threat to, to us and to what we want. We want to be gods too. That's why daily repentance and renewal is so important. God, forgive me for wanting to be God. <laughs> That's the problem. Question. When the question when Jesus asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man? Mm. And he answered, and who is he? That I mean, what did the what did what was in his mind? The, the blind man, the former blind man's mind. What, what was when he said "son of man"? What was what was what was their concept of what the son of man was at this point in time? <clears throat> the concept of son of man comes from uh, the Old Testament book of Daniel, and um, uh, son of man is used differently in Ezekiel. 
But in Daniel and in other places, Daniel talks about seeing one like a son of man. And he is seeing the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. The son of man is the Christ. So the man has already said, the once blind man, he's a prophet. And so, in other words, he trusts the word of Jesus because that's, that, that's the word that gave him sight. So then uh, Jesus says, do you believe in the Son of Man? You just tell me who he is and I will believe. Right? He said, I am he. And notice his reaction. He worshipped him. He worshipped Jesus. The word in the Greek is proskuneo, which means to fall down and worship. So he is acknowledging now, this isn't just a prophet. This is God in the flesh, the Son of Man promised back by the... We're seeing two things. Physical sight and spiritual sight. Yes. And the Physical sight is only in the eyes of Jesus an unspectacular and unimportant symbol of the real thing. Real sight. It's the same thing that happens when the friends lower their paralytic friend on a mat. And what's the first thing that Jesus says? That's not the first thing. He says, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees in that crowd around are horrified. And then what does Jesus say? Well, and who is this? Well, so you know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. Son, pick up your mat and walk. So that the miracle is but, remember, we've talked about this, especially in John. The miracle is only a sign. It's not the end point. It's not, it's not the whole point of the, the, uh, the event. It is meant to point to something deeper. Jesus gives healing to the man on the mat as a way of saying, if I can do that, I can do the much bigger thing, which is to forgive the sins of sinners, to forgive those who are dead in their trespasses. Right? That's why he says, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Right? So all of these are mere signs. We, and this is a problem. There are whole movements in church history that exist today that are built on the idea that the end point for Jesus is for you to have a happy life and to be healthy. You know, and they'll even say, if, you, if you're not healthy, there's a problem with you spiritually. Tell that to St. Paul. Three times I asked God to remove flesh, the thorn from my flesh. And three times he said what? No. My grace is sufficient. Why? Because my power is perfected in your weakness. Right? My, God's power is not perfected in us when we've got everything we want. God's power is perfected in us when we are so vulnerable and so aware of our humanity and our sin and our finitude that God can begin to work. There, there's a... I don't recommend everything about the Philadelphia story with Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn and Jimmy Stewart. Great, great movie. Crisp dialogue, but some weird stuff in it too. But at one point, uh, Tracy says 
something along the lines that she's just a wreck. She's not all that. And Cary Grant's character says, that's a very good sign. When we acknowledge, when we can acknowledge our humanity and our weakness and not pretend to be all that, that's the moment that God can work with us. Right? So now, in a sense, this is the turning point of the gospel. We see that the opposition is beginning to array against him. That's going to be solidified finally in chapter 11. Um, and I'm going to suggest something heretical. I'm suggesting we skip chapter 10. Other than to say that in this chapter, Jesus identifies himself as the good shepherd. And he also says something stunning in verse 30 of chapter 10. He says, uh, let me find it. I and the Father are one. He accepted the worship of the once blind man. If Jesus were not truly God and he accepted worship, he would either be some sort of sinister evil person or crazy. Now he says, I and the Father are one. And notice who gets top billing in that statement. Jesus. <laughs> so it would seem the height of presumption. But he's saying, I am the word made flesh. Now, he wouldn't have thought of it in terms of top billing, but I and the Father are one. Now I want to go into chapter 11. Would someone read verses 1 to 4, please? Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Okay, so once again, why, did it, why is the man blind? So that God may be glorified through him. Now his friend Lazarus is sick, and he says, It's so that God will be glorified through him this event all right let's uh strut along verses 5 to uh 16 please now jesus loved martha and her sister and lazarus so when he heard that lazarus was ill he stayed two days longer in the place where he was then after this he said to the disciples let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now speaking, seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, after saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, what most people I think get wrong, about, I don't know this for a fact, but I think most people get this wrong, the statement by Thomas, 
What do we know about Thomas? He's not a doubter. He's an unbeliever. He's still following around Jesus so that he finds something about Jesus that he wants to hear and be around, but he hasn't gotten to the point where he believes. And so, and remember, even after the resurrection, unless I see the scars, unless, et cetera, et cetera I will not believe. So this is a hard-nosed character. What is he saying here? This is sarcasm. He's going to go into the teeth of Judea where people have been going after him and he says, oh, let's just go and get killed with him. That's the idea here. This is, this is resignation and sarcasm. He thinks this is a completely stupid thing to do. That's where he's at. With the personalities of the disciples sometimes come through more clearly in John than in the other Gospels. Maybe because it was written by John. And notice John always seemed to come out the hero. <laughs> well, that's another story. Um, so, Jesus deliberately waits. He deliberately waits to go back until he knows Lazarus is dead. Because he's got bigger fish to fry. And poor Lazarus is going to have to die twice. Just so Jesus can make a point. <laughs> okay. Would someone pick up at verse 17 and read through 27? On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. All right, so he's good and dead. Right? And there's no embalming. That explains what happens next. Go ahead. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Okay, now this is very interesting. She goes out and she chastises Jesus. We got a message to you earlier. If you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. And Jesus totally turns the whole thing around. Your brother's going to rise. Well, yeah, I know they're in the, you know, in the big general, uh, general resurrection of the dead because that's how the Jews thought the resurrection, those Jews who believed in the resurrection thought the resurrection would happen. That there was no, that a single person couldn't be brought back from the dead. Now, what Lazarus experiences here is not really what we call resurrection. It's a sign of resurrection because he's, he doesn't have a resurrection body, right? He is still a mortal and, and dies again, all right? But it's a sign, another sign of what Jesus can and does do. So she upbraids him, but then he calls out for her to confess her faith and boy she does it beautifully and Jesus gives this great gospel promise that I can't ever give enough of which is I am the resurrection and the dead of I am the resurrection and the life and whoever believes in me will never die and he who dies will rise again right this is the this is the razor Jesus the razor r-a-i-s-e-r he will lift you up. All right. Uh, oof, we only have a few minutes. Uh, someone read verses 28 to 37, please. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and said, The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, 
but was still at the place where Magna had met her. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforted her, he noticed how quickly she got up and went out and followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and found, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you have been with me, let it be my heart. There we go again. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from So now, wait a minute now. He did that big deal over there. Couldn't he have done? What's going on? Yeah. What, what are his limitations? What, what is happening here? Now, this is interesting. Martha chastises Jesus. And uh, I'm sorry, Mary chastises Jesus. And uh, eventually Jesus weeps. Now there's a great debate about why Jesus weeps. I think it's a combination of things. He's weeping over their grief. God weeps over our grieving. He never intended for us to grieve. But I also think it's frustration. What does St. Paul say about grieving? He said, we do not grieve as those without hope. He does not say, we do not grieve. Of course we grieve. But we do not grieve as people without hope. What Jesus is seeing here is grieving without hope. And that grieves him. He comes to give us life. And that abundantly. He says that in the Gospel of John. Meaning everlastingly. We were not meant for grief. But it comes to us in this fallen world. And so Jesus weeps. Both in grief and in frustration because of his love for these people. We're going to leave Lazarus in the tomb for an, another week. <laughs> Lazarus, hey! I think it's in God, both Mary and Martha have faith and Jesus has always been there. Yes. Yeah, I think, and that's, that's an important point. Well, but we all do this as Christians. Yeah. We are, we have a friend who is uh, now in hospice care. She's 42. Oh, uh, We've known her since she was in high school. Wonderful mom, wonderful wife, great husband. And uh, Ann and I spent some time with them this past week. And you want to say, why? Why? And I don't have answers. I don't know why. Except this is a fallen world. And I never, um, if we ever get used to to this, it means heaven's no longer in our hearts. Because um, the reason we grieve is that God has made us to expect something different. He made us for eternity. So rage against death. Rage against it. But know that Christ dies with us. And Christ raises us. I can't understand why Jim Carter has been in hospice for like a year.
Yeah. Yeah. It is an extreme example, but it is, you know, and I can, so many times I've had people who were 98, 99, immobilized, and they say, why am I still here? Why am I still here? Um, and yet, I know a woman whose mom just turned 100. She's amazing. You know, she's living in a care facility, but she can do a heck of a lot and really sharp. Who knows? I got to get going. Why don't we pray? We'll pick up on that chapter next week, okay? We're going to do, what is it, Evelyn Evelyn Wood uh, Speed Study. That's what we're going to do. Let's pray. Faithful God, thank you so much. Thank you for your grace that accepts us as we are and then loves us into being who you make us to be. You are awesome and wonderful. Lord, we thank you that Myron is able to be here with us today and we pray that you'd give him continued healing. And Lord, we pray that we will carry your word into our week so that you are honored and glorified and others can see how great you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone. And bye, Facebook crowd. Bye.